Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Sword of Destiny by Andrei Sapkowski. So this is book number two in the Witch series, and it's another book of short stories. I will read you the blurb, and then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs. Geralt is a witcher, a man whose magic powers, enhanced by long training in a mysterious elixir, have made him a brilliant fighter and a merciless assassin. His targets are the deadly monsters which ravage the land and attack the innocent. He roams the country seeking work, but comes to realise that while some of his quarry are unremittingly vile, others are the victims of sin, or evil, or simple naivety. In this collection of short stories, following the adventures of the hit collection The Last Wish, join Geralt and his companions as they battle monsters, demons, and prejudices alike. So, I've never played any of the Witcher games, uh, I haven't watched the series yet, although I will be watching it soon, uh, and so I guess I remain relatively unscathed by it all so far. But yeah, by the time I've read novel number three, I'm sure I'll have watched the series. <laughs> I thought this little conversation here was good on the nature of good versus evil. Quite a, selective, quite a selective approach, very practical I'd say. But at the root of it lies some idea, Gerald. The conflict between the forces of order and the forces of chaos, as a sorcerer acquaintance of mine used to say. I imagine that you carry out your mission, defending people from evil, always and everywhere, without distinction. You stand on a clearly defined side of the palisade. The forces of order, the forces of chaos. Awfully high-flown words, Borch. You desperately want to position me on one side of the palisade in a conflict, which is generally thought to be perennial, began long before us and will endure long after we've gone. On which side does the farrier shoeing horses stand, or our innkeeper hurrying here with a cauldron of lamb? What, in your opinion, defines the border between chaos and order? A very simple thing, said Three Jackdaws, and looked him straight in the eye. That which represents chaos is menace, is the aggressive side, while order is the side being threatened, in need of protection, in need of a defender. But let us drink and make a start on the lamb. So this bit here is a little bit about the rivalry between Gerald of Rivia and Eek of D Denesley. I don't know how to pronounce any of these words. He isn't keen on you, Dora Grace said, riding over. Eh, Gerald? Clearly. Competition, isn't it? The two of you have similar occupations, except that Ike is an idealist and you are a professional. A minor difference, particularly for the ones you kill. Don't compare me to Ike, Dora Gray. The devil knows who you, the devil knows who you wrong with that comparison, him or me, but don't compare us. As you wish. To me, frankly speaking, you are equally loathsome. We have a dwarf who goes, uh, don't learn me how to talk. And that's one of my pet hates when people say that, like don't learn me instead of don't teach me. Because grammatically speaking, it should be don't teach me. Oh, my head's gonna explode. I thought this little conversation here was interesting because it kind of, it reflects the nature of humanity in our world. Uh, a zoigle, said the sorceress as she reached for another vial from the impressive collection on the table and removed the cork from it. The fragrance of lilac and gooseberries filled the room. Well, well, even in a town it's easy for a witcher to find work. You don't have to roam through the wilds at all. You know, Istred maintains it's becoming a general rule. The place of every creature from the forests and swamps that becomes extinct is occupied by something else. Some new mutation, adapted to the artificial environment created by people. We have a little bit of sort of myth making slash storytelling here which I like. Among the elves, the sorceress whispered pensively, there is a legend about a winter queen who travels the land during snowstorms in a sleigh drawn by white horses. As she rides, she casts hard, sharp, tiny shards of ice around her and woe betide anyone whose eye or heart is pierced by one of them. That person is then lost. No longer will anything gladden them. They find anything that doesn't have the whiteness of snow ugly, obnoxious, repugnant. They will not find peace, will abandon everything, and will set off after the queen in pursuit of their dream and love. Naturally, they will never find it and will die of longing. Apparently here, in this town, something like that happened in times long gone. It's a beautiful legend, isn't it? Elves can couch everything in pretty words, he muttered drowsily. I thought this was interesting in terms of the magic system and how it works. So uh, the witcher makes a joke about uh, sorceress uh, Istred that she uses virgin blood. And he says, uh, but you do use blood occasionally, don't you? You can't even contemplate some spells I've heard without the blood of a virgin, ideally one killed by a lightning bolt from a clear sky during a full moon. In what way, one wonders, is that blood better than that of an old strumpet who fell drunk from a palisade? In no way, the sorcerer agreed a pleasant smile playing on his lips. But if it became common knowledge that that role could actually be played just as easily by hog's blood, which is much easier to obtain, then the rabble would begin experimenting with spells. But if it means the rabble having to gather and use virgin's blood, dragon's tears, white tarantula's venom, decoction of severed baby's hands or a corpse exhumed at midnight, many would think again. Fair play. That's the kind of thing that Terry Pratchett would think of. 
and we get a Doppler as well, a doppelganger, uh, which I've come across before, like in Dungeons and Dragons, for example. So they take on the form of somebody else and kind of be- become indistinguishable from the real person, you know. Geralt the Witcher says, don't be too hard on them, Dainty, Geralt said. They didn't have a chance. A mimic copies so exactly, there's no way of distinguishing it from the original. I mean, from its chosen victim. Have you ever heard of mimics? Some, but I thought it was all fiction. Well, it isn't. All a Doppler has to do is observe its victim closely in order to quickly and unerringly adapt to the necessary material structure. I would point out that it's not an illusion, but a complete, precise transformation to the minutest detail. How a mimic does it, no one knows. Sorcerers suspect the same component of the blood is at work here as with lycanthropy, but I think it's either something totally different or a thousandfold more powerful. After all, a werewolf has only two, at most three different forms, while a Doppler can transform into anything it wants to, as long as the body mass more or less tallies. And uh, we learn some more about how it works. Um, Geralt says, It's not an exaggeration, believe it or not, but at this moment it is you, Dainty. In some unknown way, the Doppler also precisely copies its victim's mentality. Mental what? The mind's properties, the character, feelings, thoughts, the soul, which would confirm what most sorcerers and all priests would deny, that the soul is also matter. Blasphemy, the innkeeper gasped. And then this doppelganger um, basically successfully invests some money belonging to the person he copied, and um, Dandelion, uh, the, the, you know, the poet minstrel, I guess, annoying poet minstrel, he uh, goes, he's earned more in three days than I've earned in my whole life by singing. In your place, the witcher said gravely, I'd quit singing and take up commerce. Ask him, he may take you on as an apprentice. And then we get a story about a duke who professes to be in love with a mermaid, but his type of love is a very dominating kind of love. Um, It's not a good kind of love, you know? Uh, So we get this. I love her, Aglovel said firmly. I want her for my wife, but for that she must have legs and not a scaly tail. And it's feasible since I bought a magical elixir with a full guarantee for two pounds of exquisite pearls. After drinking it, she'll grow legs. She'll just suffer a little for three days, no more. Call her, Witcher. Tell her again. So, um, Dandelion, the uh, minstrel or whatever, the Witcher calls him and he says, You're a cynic, a lecher, a womanizer, and a liar. And I'm just there like, is he talking about Charles Bukowski? I think this um, says a lot about human beings as well. Basically, there's a story in which um, there's some trouble at the bottom of the ocean. So Essie says, The ocean is immense, Aglaval. No one has explored what lies beyond the horizon, if anything is there at all. The ocean is bigger than any wilderness, deep into which you have driven the elves. It is less accessible than any mountains or ravines where you have massacred were-lynxes. And on the floor of the ocean dwells a race which uses weapons and knows the arcana of metalworking. Beware, Aglaval. If archers begin to sail with the pearl divers, you will begin a war with something you don't understand. What you mean to disturb may turn out to be a hornet's nest. I advise you, leave them the sea, for the sea is not for you. You don't know and will never know whither lead those steps which go down to the bottom of the dragon's fangs. And then Aglaval responds, and this is just a very human response, I think. You are mistaken, Miss Davin, Aglaval said calmly. We shall learn whither lead those steps. Further, we shall descend those steps. We shall find out what is on that side of the ocean, if there is anything there at all. And we shall draw from the ocean everything we can. And if not we, then our grandsons will do it, or our grandsons' grandsons. It is just a matter of time. Yes, we shall do it, though the ocean will run red with blood. And you know it, Essie, oh wise Essie, who writes the chronicles of humanity in your ballads. Life is not a ballad, O oh poor little gorgeous-eyed poet, lost among her fine words. Life is a battle, and we were taught that struggle by these witches whose worth is greater than ours. It is they who showed us the way, who paved the way for us. They strewed the path with the corpses of those who stood in the way of humans and defended that world from us. We, Essie, are only continuing that battle. It is we, not your ballads, who create the chronicles of humanity, and we no longer need witches, and now nothing will stop us. Nothing. I thought this was interesting as well. This is a dryad talking. She says, It is easy to kill with a bow, girl. How easy it is to release the bowstring and think, It is not I, not I, it is the arrow. The blood of that boy is not on my hands. The arrow killed him, not I. But the arrow does not dream anything in the night. May you dream nothing in the night either, blue-eyed dryad. Farewell, Brian. And that just made me think, like, Arrows don't kill people, dryads do. Summon the police, summon the witcher. <laughs> and here in uh, the... S- which story is this one? And here in something more, uh, we get a spin on a fairy tale, because we have here, You will give me, the horseman in the black coat suddenly and quickly recited, whatever you come across at home on your return, but did not expect. Which is, you know, a staple of many fairy tales. But I don't want to spoil it for you by telling you what that is, but 
so I'm going to go straight to my rating. I gave this a 4 out of 5. I enjoyed this a lot more than the first book. Possibly because I was more in the mood and knew what to expect a lot more with this one as well. But yeah, it really dragged me in and I'm really feeling the uh, Witcher mythos. I haven't watched the Netflix show yet and I haven't played the games. And to be honest, I might keep that like that for a little while and just crack on with reading the book. So I'm planning on reading, you know, probably one a month for the foreseeable future. So as always, thanks a lot for watching, don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so what you thought of it, hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video, thanks a lot, bye bye.